Hello, welcome to today's physics lesson. The topic for the day is atomic physics. We'll be looking at the atomic models and structure of the atom. By the end of this lesson, we should be able to describe the atomic structure and mention the atomic particles. We should be able to explain the Rutherford atomic model, define atomic number and mass number, and we should be able to write and interpret atomic notations and then round it off by defining isotopy. So let's get started. We already know that matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. That is um, from uh, the first, the first uh, postulate of what the atom is by doubting. We already know that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space also. So, these atoms that we talk about, we know that they consist a tiny nucleus at the center. This nucleus consists positively charged protons and neutrally charged neutrons. Neutral means that the neutrons have no charge, while the protons have a positive charge. And both the proton and the neutron are inside the nucleus of an atom. And the nucleus is at the center of the atom. Now, around this nucleus, we have shells in which the electrons orbit. Now, these electrons are negatively charged. So we have the negatively charged electrons orbiting in shells around the nucleus. Then we have the protons that are positively charged and the neutrons that have no charge, both inside the nucleus. So those are the three particles that we have that make up an atom, the proton and neutron inside the nucleus, and then the electron in shells around the nucleus. Now, this is an atomic model that is called the nuclear model. It was propounded by Rutherford and Marsden based on their alpha scattering experiments. And then much later, Bob, uh, altered their own work to give us the electron shells in which electrons orbit. Let's look at the summary of the Rutherford atomic model. The present atomic model that we are using now is an offshoot of NS Rutherford and Hans Geiger alpha scattering experiment. What did they do? Alpha particles were directed at a thin gold foil. They directed alpha particles as thin gold foil. Now, they observed that most of the alpha particles passed through the foil without any deflection. They went right through, straight through. But a few of them were deflected. And some were actually rebounded. And those that were deflected and rebounded, they noticed that those were the ones that tried to pass through the center of the atom. So, at the center of the atom, the alpha particles either were rebounding or they were getting deflected. They were getting deviated from that straight uh, line of motion. So, they concluded that there must be something at that center of the atom, of the gold foil, that was making the alpha particles to rebound. And then they call that the nucleus. They decided that there must be a tiny part of the atom at that center, which had a charge and which had a heavy core and was deflecting and rebounding the alpha particles that it directed at it. Oh, and just as a, an aside, if you intend to know more about alpha particles and radiations in general, there's a video on that also on this YouTube channel, David Oluwada on YouTube. You may want to subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can also get notifications when new videos are posted. So, Rutherford and uh, Geiger decided that there has to be a nucleus at the center of the atom. They then proposed a planetary model of the atom. And what is that model? The model is that the atom consists of a positively charged heavy core called the nucleus, where most of the mass of the atom is concentrated, and negatively charged electrons in orbits around the nucleus. 
much like how planets orbit around the sun. Now, the work of Rutherford was actually an improvement over the previous work done by Doubting and by Plum. As I said earlier, Doubting was the one who told us that matter consists of small particles called atoms, and then Plum gave us another model where he postulated that an atom consists of protons and electrons that are uh, arranged equally all over the atom. But now Rutherford said no, protons and neutrons must be at the center of the atom, that's in the nucleus, while the electrons are the ones orbiting around the uh, nucleus of the atom. These diagrams give us uh, uh, the illustrations of what Rutherford did. The first diagram, the one on the left, is the source of alpha particles. You can see the thin gold foil. We can see that there is a small number of alpha particles that are significantly deflected. And then we have most of them passing through straight through the foil. And then we have some that are slightly deflected. So that was the uh, alpha scattering experiment of Rutherford. And then they came up with the planetary model, which you can also see on the screen here. That is that we have the protons and neutrons at the center of the atom. We now have electrons moving around in orbits around the nucleus. Of course, there has been a development over that. We now know that electrons are actually not in orbits, but in specific shells around the nucleus of the atom. The work done by Rutherford had two main problems. One, Rutherford predicted that light of a continuous range of wavelengths will be emitted. But we know that that's not the case because experiments have shown that discrete emission of line spectra is what is experienced rather than a continuous spectra that uh, Rutherford predicted. That was the first issue. That was the first problem that Rutherford's model had. The second one was that Rutherford predicted that atoms are unstable and that electrons will quickly spiral into the nucleus. But we know that atoms are largely stable because at least all around us, we have matter all around us and those electrons in those matter those don't spiral into them. There's no collapse around us. There is no, uh, uh, there is no collapse in anything that is around us. So, we know that the, uh, these two postulations are not right. To correct these anomalies, a, a new scientist, Neil Bohr, did his own work, carried out his own experiments, and then he proposed that electrons can only orbit in specific circular orbits called energy levels, and not just in orbits, but in energy levels, and that outside these specific energy levels, no other orbit was possible. So it's either an electron was in one electronic shell, or in the next one, or in the third one, but there cannot be anything in between. Then the second um, postulate of Neil Bohr is that the energy of the electron in atom cannot vary continuously, but it can only have a discrete, specific value called quantized energy value. So Nebel invariably told us that an electron cannot continue to have in changing amount of energy in it. It cannot continue to have increasing or reducing amount of energy. Rather, an electron will only possess a discrete value, a specific value, which is called a quantized energy value. This concept was, is what gave rise to energy quantization, which you can see in another video. There's also a video on that on this YouTube channel explaining what energy quantization is. Here we have diagrams of the Bohr model. We have the protons and neutrons at the center of the nucleus. And then we have the electrons in the shells. We have two shells around that nucleus. So the two shells have their electrons. Two electrons are on the innermost shell, and then we have four on the outer shell. 
And then we have energy levels of electrons also as postulated by Bohr. This one is for the hydrogen atom. So each energy level there has its own discrete energy value. There cannot be anything in between. It's a discrete spectrum. So that is the work. That is the result of the work done by Neil Bohr. And that is what we now work with today. The Bohr model of the atom is what is generally now accepted. But it was a development on the work done by Rutherford. Now let's look at what atoms and isotopes are. As we said earlier, at the center of the atom is a nucleus. The nucleus consists of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. And then negatively charged electrons move in shells around the nucleus. Therefore, we can see that an, an atom is electrically neutral because the protons that are positively charged and the electrons that are negatively charged, they are equal in number. So the positive charges will cancel out all the negative charges. And then, of course, the neutron has no charge. So the atom is electrically neutral. But we have instances where an atom loses an electron or it gains an electron. If that occurs, when the atom loses an electron, that means that it will now have more protons than electrons because it has lost an electron. So the number of electrons has reduced, but the number of protons remains the same. So there are now more protons than electrons. In that case, the atom has become positively charged. However, if the atom gains electrons, that means that it now has more electrons than the protons that it has. So, there are more negative charges than positive charges. So, an atom that gains electrons is said to be negatively charged. And both of them, once an atom loses or gains electrons, they are called ions. They are called ions. It is important to note that what is gained or lost by the atom is the electron, not the protons. So do not say because an atom is positively charged, then that means it gained protons. No. Protons are not gained or lost. They remain as they are. The electrons are what is lost or gained. So if an atom becomes positively charged, it is because it had lost an electron, making the number of electrons it needs to be less than the number of protons. Now, the atomic mass of an atom, that is the sum of the atomic number and the number of neutrons. The atomic number is the number of protons, by the way. Number of protons is called atomic number. Now, addition of the atomic number and the number of neutrons is what gives us the atomic mass. That was why Rutherford said that at the center of an atom is a heavy mass. That's where its mass is concentrated. Because that's where the proton and the neutron are. And the addition of these two is what gives us the atomic mass of the atom. Now, atomic mass is also called nucleon number. Because both the proton and the neutron are found in the nucleus. So, the particles in the nucleus are called nucleons. So, nucleon number is also uh, a synonym for atomic mass or mass number. The notation for the nuclear number or the atomic mass is A, capital letter A. That's what we use to represent the atomic mass of any atom. So also, the atomic number, which is the number of protons, is denoted by Z, capital letter Z. If you look at this screen, we have the atomic notation. That's how, the, that's how each atom is represented. X represents the chemical symbol for the element. For instance, hydrogen has a symbol of, of capital H. Helium is capital H, small e. Um, chlorine is capital C, small l. So that is what X represents there. Now the A is the mass number or the atomic mass of that element. So for chlorine, for instance, that means that if this were to be a chlorine atom, that A will not be A. We will write the number there. That's 35. Then for Z, that is the number of protons. Number of protons for chlorine, that will be 17. 
For carbon, X will be, uh, will be C because the symbol for carbon is C, capital letter C. Then A will be 12 or 13 or 14 depending on, on what isotope you are referring to. And then Z will be 6. That is how an atom is noted. That was the denotation of an atom. The atomic mass is a superscript, the atomic number is a subscript, and X is the chemical symbol for the element. The number of protons that we have in the nucleus of an atom helps in identifying the element. You just want to know what element it is. So for instance, six. If it, uh, an element has six number of protons, that's carbon. If it has one, that's hydrogen. That's how we know. The number of electrons determine its chemical behavior, how they re re relate or react with other elements, their chemical behaviors, the chemical reaction they undergo. Now, the neutral atoms have equal numbers of protons and electrons. I said that earlier. If an atom is neutral, then the number of protons and number of electrons are the same. But the number of neutrons may vary. Number of neutrons may vary. So, when we have atoms of the same element that have different number of uh, neutrons but the same number of protons, then we call those isotopes of the same element. So, isotopy is therefore a phenomenon where atoms of the same element have the same atomic number but different numbers of neutrons. And since atomic mass is the addition of the number of protons and the number of neutrons, once the number of neutrons become different, even though the number of protons remain the same, the atomic mass will be different. So isotopes of the same elements have different masses, but they have the same number of protons in them. So, for instance, carbon-12 and carbon-14 are isotopes of carbon. They have the same atomic number, that's 6. 6 is the atomic number, uh, atomic number for carbon. But they have different atomic masses. For carbon-12, its own mass is 12. For carbon-14, its own mass is 14. That is because they have different numbers of neutrons. Here we have a slide that shows the atomic notations. Again, you can see the one for chlorine, as I mentioned earlier. So, the X that we had earlier is now Cl, that is chemical symbol for chlorine. The atomic number Z, that is the subscript, that one is 17, and atomic mass is 35. The same thing for oxygen. In the oxygen here, the two minus there that you see means that that oxygen is actually negatively charged. Negatively charged, meaning that it has two excess electrons than the protons. So that oxygen is actually an ion. Now, on the next uh, photograph, you can see some isotopes. We have the isotopes of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. You can see there are numbers of protons. They are all the same, but numbers of neutrons vary. Therefore, the atomic mass varies. The same thing for hydrogen. Hydrogen also has three isotopes, protium, deuterium, and tritium. And there, this is where we'll end the lesson for this class. We have a homework. Just go and write the atomic notation for helium. You have to go and look for the chemical symbol for helium, cesium, and radon. Look for their atomic masses. Look for their atomic numbers, and then write the notation for them. And then in tabular form, Calculate the number of protons, number of neutrons, and number of electrons for each of them as well. Do it in a table that we can compare them. And then I talked briefly about the Thomson's atomic theory and also the Thomson's atomic model. You may want to go and read up on those ones as well.